Good evening and welcome to tonight's session of Diversity Matters, where we will be uh, discussing the topic colorism, shades of acceptability. Our host and moderator is Vicki Hughes, and thank you for joining us this evening. Good evening. Again, I am Reverend Vicki Hughes, and I am the host and moderator for this evening. This is actually our fourth dialogue that we've had this summer. And you've heard us talk about topics like Black Lives Matter, police brutality, tackling racism and religion-based racism. Tonight, we're gonna to be talking about colorism, colorism, shades of acceptability. And viewers, if you would, I wanna ask you if you would please share this live on your Facebook pages. Um, I would love for your Facebook friends to join us tonight. We're going deep into the topic of colorism. We're gonna talk about colorism in the African-American community, other ethnicities, and also something you may not have even heard of, colorism in the Caucasian community. Yes, it actually exists. I want to briefly just introduce colorism. It's a term that you won't necessarily find in the dictionary. Author and activist Alice Walker is who penned um, this term, the originator of the term. In her 1983 book called In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, she defines this term as prejudicial or preferential treatment of same race people based solely on their color. Light skin preference has been a practice in the black community for decades. And we can't continue this if we're going to progress as a people. You might ask what co causes colorism. And after a lot of research online and reading some various articles, I came up with discrimination, social conditioning, racism, white supremacy, self-hatred, self-deprivation and colorism is viewed as racism. It's viewed as a societal ill. Colorism in the black community dates back to slavery and it implies that light, lighter skin and straighter hair are better features to have. Lighter slaves were favored. They were normally the house slaves and then the darker slaves were called field slaves out in the fields, picking the crops. Colorism negatively affects the mental health of African-Americans in ways like depression and anxiety. So we'll talk about that tonight. And colorism, just so you know, was intentionally used to cause separatism during slavery years. Let me quickly throw out some terms, labels, high yellow, red bone, caramel, blacky, darky, blue black, some evaluative comments that you may have heard over the years would be, you're pretty for a dark skinned girl, or I'm not black, I'm brown. If any of the viewers have had experiences with comments like that, you're pretty for a dark skinned girl or woman, please um, make a comment and we'll see it and you know, address your concern, or if you want to talk about your hurt and pain, that's fine. Some behavioral cues are avoiding direct exposure to sunlight, excessive grooming of one's own hair, attempting to alter or minimize certain facial features like bleaching your skin. So now let's begin. I want to begin the dialogue. And the first thing that I want to talk about is called the doll test and it has been around since the 1940s. And I have, uh, excuse me, I have two guest panelists on tonight. One is my mother, Evelyn Hughes, and I wanted her to tell us some things about the dial test. Mother Evelyn. Thank you. The dial test uh, took place quite a number of years ago and it consisted of having black dolls and white dolls on a table or any place and ask children which doll they would like to have. 
and 90% of the time, the doll was the white one that was chosen, even by the black little girls. One of the reasons for that would be that uh, whenever you see uh, dolls, uh, when I came along, when, when I would see dolls, they were white. It was very difficult to find dolls of color. Actually, uh, kind of difficult to find them in the 60s. So since the 60s, of course, they, um, the manufacturers have uh, discovered that there's a market for the African-American dolls, the uh, other race dolls. But the fact that the little black children chose the white doll 90% of the time was disturbing because it meant that they probably didn't like themselves because they were choosing uh, another uh, well, I, I'd say just another color. It wasn't something that they were taught. It was just something that was normal. So one thing I often think about, though, is this. And this applies today as much as it would have applied in the 40s or the 30s or whenever. And that has to do with self-esteem. One thing that we need to really, really emphasize is that we should teach our children and uh, make sure that we praise them for things that they do. Uh, teach them how to do different things and praise them. Uh, also, never uh, let them hear you uh, say something negative just because of someone's color or someone's size or whatever. So high self-esteem, in my opinion, is one of the best things that one can have. Uh, it can be taught and it should be taught by the various means uh, of praise and so forth. Okay, thank you, Mother Evelyn. <laughs> Yes, that's that will be your nickname for tonight. Okay, that that doll test that she was just talking about was created by two African American psychologists, Dr. Kenneth Clark and Dr. Mamie Clark. And just to add to what she was saying, they they described the um, the black dolls as ugly and bad, and the white dolls as good and pretty. So basically, you know, positive attributes were associated with the white doll and negative attributes were associated with the black doll. Um, I wanted to ask, let's see, um, Jasmine, um, as far as when you were growing up, did you have, by the time you came along, did, I think there were probably several black dolls out on the market for your parents to buy you, correct? Um. I was, I'm an 85 baby. So I, 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 I do remember there being options. Um, okay. There were definitely black dolls, but usually you would find them in the collectors. So you would get the collectors dolls and they would have the really Afrocentric features and things like that. Otherwise, if you're talking about, you know, the Barbies and the skippers, they usually just, just like Barbie and skipper just black <laughs> but not with afrocentric clothes afrocentric hair nothing like that um i i'd say the first time that i really really i mean and this was past barbie that i really saw some sort of representation that really seemed to dive into who we were was Addie in the american dog collection um and they had the different books and everything um it was it was the first doll that I was just like, okay, I really want that one because she represents me. But at the same time, there was also the notion of the fact that she was the only black doll in the collection at the time. And the first thing, or it seems like the only story that they could go to was the story of slavery, 
which very much, yes, we can we can talk about slavery as far as our history is concerned. But when you had all of these other dolls from other backgrounds, there there were various backgrounds they could they could point to. And it seemed like when it came to the black doll, it was just slavery. That's it. There's we can't make a light skinned doll. We can't make a dark skinned doll that does something different in their background. It's black dolls, slavery. When um when you were talking about Addie, I didn't grow up with that that collection. You're talking about so was Addie light skin? Addie brown was dark skin, skin, dark skin. She was dark skin. Dark skin? Okay. And she had you said Afrocentric, so did she have an Afro or no, what, what, what was her hair like? She didn't have an Afrocentric uh I'm sorry, she didn't have an Afro. She had uh they they made her hair like black and you know, kind of styled in a way that it might have been styled from back in the day, you know. But I mean, it's not like she had on like Afrocentric clothes or anything. She was the, the Addie doll basically represented a girl named Addie who was who had ran from who had escaped from slavery with her mother. Oh. So it was to look like basically like a girl just out of slavery. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. <laughs> OK, um, let's see, Barbara. What was your experience with dolls? The, um, this is Barbara McKinney. She's another guest panelist tonight. I don't recall really growing up with dolls, but I'm the youngest of six and I had four sisters. So there were five females in the home and I was the darkest of the five. That's um, as far as dolls, I think I'd always probably had dolls of color. As a mother of four girls, my oldest, born in 89, um, I'd always purchased brown dolls, Afrocentric culture dolls, and they did have them. Um, always black art in the home magazines that reflected black culture, um, a diversity of shades of black, just black beauty as a whole. Me with dolls, though, I don't remember really growing up playing with dolls. I probably was outside more so. Um, and them, I don't remember them playing with dolls so much, but they did have them. I know I bought them dolls. They had male and female dolls of color. Um, as far as colorism, I don't, uh, it wasn't so much of an issue in my family that was addressed, but I know in society I did experience it. Um, didn't really understand it till later when I heard, um, probably, later elementary school uh, guys in the neighborhood were teasing a group of girls and they were trying to figure out what to call me. They, uh, they will call one chubby, one will be called um, stupid goofy. And, and they decided, okay, we'll call her black. That was probably one of my first experiences. Um, so my sisters are much, much, much lighter shade than I am but I didn't experience colorism in the family. I do know people would say, well, she's your sister too. <laughs> oh, they, wow. would someone, they would assume someone else was their sister instead of me. Um, mm -hmm. I, it took me a while before I realized why. Okay, because I'm dark and they're lighter complexion. Um, as far as dolls, didn't have much of an issue with that. Didn't have that issue with my children um, in the home. I'm, I'm thankful that I didn't experience some of the things that I've heard other people experience, but I'm definitely the darker shade in the home in my family. My daughters are as well, but I'd always thought black is beautiful. My family kind of embraced black beauty. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I purposely, um, you know, have a, a panel with different complected people, um, different ethnicities and everything. So, uh, let's see. So I have two guys on here tonight and I think five women. I'm trying to count. Uh, okay, so let, let's talk about, um, you know, the, the light skin versus dark skin issue within the uh, African American community. Um, you know, so I, I know some of y'all, so we have light skin, um, brown skin, medium skin, and dark skin on here. So anybody can start 
So Vicky, I'm going to jump in um, and just tell a quick little story about um, myself as far as my acceptance of my skin color. Um, When I was born, I was very fair to the point where the doctor kept checking my mother's wristband and checking mine to make sure that I was her child. I had curly ringlets of, of, of black hair and I was very, very fair. And as I grew up, um, I started to, my color started to come in, but even as a little boy, I was very, very fair. And I remember um, I was, you know, my grandparents are, are, are a range of, of shades and um, my, my dad is darker. And I remember being a little boy and being upset, just I was so upset that I wasn't as dark as my dad because I thought he was, he looked so cool and his skin was so, was so nice looking to me that I couldn't understand it. And I got, we were talking, I might've been five or six years old. And I just said, well, I don't have hair like you and I don't have skin like you. And I really wanted that. And um, I was, I think about it to this day. And my dad really affirmed me in that moment by, 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 telling me about um, the Jesus child and saying, you know, going through scripture and saying, look, the the scripture says Jesus had skin like Burl and he had skin like Jasper and his hair was like, was like lamb's wool. And just because you don't have hair just like me and your hair is more coarse or your skin isn't as dark, doesn't mean you're not as as beautiful as, as you think I am or you think other people are. Um, so that really set me up um, for success as far as going into a private school um, where I was one of five Black children in the class and um, experienced colorism in that space, but wasn't really phased by it because um, I had the foundation, like Barbara was, was mentioning, of the idea of Black beauty and what that looked like and how many different shades and shapes that that came in. So I just wanted to start the conversation by saying um, that I was really grateful for that experience um, very young. Okay, yes, it definitely matters what you're taught and told in your households when you're, you know, by your parents and other family members as you're growing up. Did, has anybody on here, um, did anybody have a negative experience in their families? Yes. When you're growing up? Somebody said yes, I think. This is Efren Juan. Okay. You said you had you did have a negative experience in your family? Yes. Okay. Um, and it's, you know, in the context of, of course, uh, the term colorism. Um, I, and I, I always like to frame it uh, within the context uh, of American culture is that what we're really dealing with is white supremacy and the different manifestations of it. Um, um, just to kind of go back and I'll tell you about that experience, but I did want to go back to the uh, doll test. Um, when that test was initially, um, conducted, uh, one of the variables and it's, it's since been updated several times. Um, there were the, the dolls that were initially used were white dolls, which were newer and older, uh, torn and worn black dolls. And so, of right. course, children, they want those uh, toys that are new. They don't want anything old. Um, but even with the updated version of that, and MSNBC, if you Google it, they have that test that was revamped. And they not only included Black children, they included Black children, Caucasian children, Hispanic and Asian children. And it was pretty much the same in terms of the preference of the uh, white dolls as opposed to the uh, black dolls. And they actually added uh, pictures of various hues in that that, um, uh, uh, study. And of course, the the children, black, Asian, Hispanic, Caucasian, all seem to prefer the lighter doll or the lighter images, even their concept of the lighter doll being good and honest or the darker doll being bad or evil. Um, So hopefully we can get a little bit more into that as we go on. But I did wanna say in terms of my experience, I remember being at a very young age um, and my grandmother was a very fair skinned or light skinned 
And that's a play on words as well, you see, because we're right. taught that light skin is fair and fair means good and just. Um, but she's right. a very light skinned uh, black woman from uh, South Carolina. And I'll never forget she and some of her friends were sitting on the front porch and uh, there was a, a lady, uh, they called her Black Jackie. And of course they referred to her as Black Jackie because she was very, very dark skinned. And she was there with her husband uh, and they were walking up the street and you know, having a little argument. And I'll never forget, and this kind of stuck with me. My grandmother said, those people are too black to be together. Now, this is my grandmother telling me this at a very young age, and that kind of stuck with me, and it affected my pers my, my 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 view of of course uh, uh, dark skinned women uh, for 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 a long time, even through uh, I would say up to high school. Uh, so um, these things are taught uh, in different ways. Um, uh, to us uh, through the dominant society and the internalized white supremacy that we've taken on in the form of black inferiority. And one of the things about white supremacy in America, it has a, it has a, a, a coding system, a racial coding system. Uh, there used to be terminology from way back in the day that says, if you're white, you're all right. Uh, if you're yellow, you're mellow. If you're brown, stick around. If you're black, stay the hell back. So there's a whole color codification in the system of white supremacy. And unfortunately, uh, our people, um, specifically uh, African-Americans, have been indoctrinated with that uh, white supremacist uh, codification of color. And it also plays out in different parts of the world. And hopefully, we'll get into that as well. Uh, but that was my experience um, uh, with, with, I guess you would call uh, colorism coming from uh, my grandmother herself. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Hmm. That's, inter that's an interesting comment. They're too black to be together. I've never heard that before. Wow. Wow. OK, anybody else want to comment? I heard somebody else. Yeah, so this is Crystal, if I could. OK. Um, okay. You know, comment just on the fact that um, you know, that comment that Efren Guan made was actually, um, you know, really interesting to think about and think about the experiences that I had as a child and as um, a teenager, where people would say things such as, you know, if, if maybe um, someone was marrying someone who was of a lighter skin tone, like, oh, you're going to have pretty babies, right? Just making that judgment based upon what what has um, either has been internalized as beauty or what has been, what people see as acceptable and an easier, perhaps, quote unquote, easier um, road for a child, right? You know, if, if they have fairer skin or, you know, long hair or, you know, just features that are a bit more closer to white. Um, you know, I'm, I'm brown skin and I, I do, it was interesting. It wasn't until maybe I was in high school and college that I really see how I internalized colorism a bit in that um, I would I would say like, oh, I'm dark skin. And um, just because, you know, I I did not feel that I I met that um, standard of what light skin or even brown skin was, you know, preconceived notions that were false, right? These false narratives. But because of just the way that I internalized my own beauty, it, the way that I saw myself and compared to others, it was very skewed, right? And um, there are many things that either words um, that people say just in conversation, the ways that um, individuals interact with one another that start building up these false narratives in our head that, um, you know, totally, until you get to a point of understanding and being able to call these things out, you may develop this completely distorted representation of yourself and the world around you because of these um, 
toxic thoughts that have been embedded in the way that you've grown up. Um, thinking about what Jasmine said in regards to, um, you know, what was available for us as kids growing up. I, I, I definitely played with Barbies. I loved Barbies. Um, and I remember that uh, the Black Barbies, they weren't really as fun to play with. You know, like they, they weren't appealing. And, and the way that, um, that they were, uh, you know, marketed, they weren't marketed very well, you know? And so it wasn't something that I w wanted to be like, ooh, let's play with. And if I did play with it, I definitely didn't play with it around my white friends, you know, because th there, again, it was like, it wasn't necessarily something that was going to be commonplace or accepted. Like me going to a play date with my white friends and bringing a black doll and I would be the only one playing with it. Right. So just thinking about also, um, you know, some of that. And so that played into quite a bit of the way that I just viewed myself and the way that um, I measured beauty. And luckily, um, you know, I had a great HBCU experience which really helped me understand myself as a Black woman um, and as a woman in general, and really helped me be able to look closely at the lies that I had um, internalized and be able to recreate and reimagine um, what, what does it mean to be a proud Black woman. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. And, and everybody, I forgot, you've never, you haven't met Crystal Spees yet. <laughs> So this is my, Crystal is my event specialist. I asked her to come on and dialogue with us tonight. Um, she is the brains of the tech person and just the brains of putting this all together, the Diversity Matters um, online, do, uh, the dialogue. So, and you know, this will be ongoing, but um, you know, sometimes you won't see her, she'll be behind the scenes. But today she's visible. So thank you so much for your comments, Crystal. I don't think we've heard from Rosie. Rosa? Hey, yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, I was actually thinking of um, speaking on the topic of dolls just briefly because I did have at a very young age in the early 90s, I believe, or mid, I'm sorry, the late 80s Cabbage Patch doll. My first was a uh, little black boy, uh, which is my favorite. Um, and I think growing up in, in my household, per se, with my grandmother, we were... Um, experienced affirmation of the black beauty um, but extended family wise wasn't always the case um, I come from a multicultural family and I did have experience not so much directly but just being in different family settings with extended family and um, my siblings my close cousins we're all a rainbow we we go from the you know lightest skin with blue eyes to the darkest skin and dark brown eyes and I'm kind of in the middle um so I was very protective of my little sister who was on the darker side for our generation um just because of the comments I noticed and I know those comments were never made in my household but just in the extended family settings you would get the you know you're so beautiful you know to be a dark skin or to be a black girl or, you know, to have that kind of hair and, you know, stuff like that. And I got really protective of her at a, a very early age and um, even called, you know, people out on it. Like, why are you talking to her like that? <laughs> you know, um, mm -hmm. and right. I mean, even in got confrontational a couple of times over that. And, and I carried that into my adulthood and kept my own children out of certain settings with extended family because of that history. Um, and then now I, ha I have my own children who are a spectrum from the rainbow. So uh, I carry, you know, I continue that protectiveness over that and, and that affirmation as well that I received from my direct household. Um, but as far as the dolls, I, I think during my childhood, um, I agree with Crystal, they just weren't I was not impressed at, at the making of the black dolls as I was at some of the, the cooler ones, which were the non-black dolls. But um, over the years, even when I start purchasing them for my daughter, who's now 25, I've seen improvement. I've seen just in the last few years, you know, I have only one daughter who's grown and I've thought, wow, I wish I had someone to buy this pretty black doll for, you know, because they have improved over the, just the last five to 10 years. 
but you know when I was younger they just weren't as it wasn't the skin color it was the, like the marketing the effort um, the representation that was put into it it just didn't seem like you know the doll that you wanted to have because it just wasn't so um, I think you know, kudos to the manufacturers who have put that attention and effort into improving it because, you know, every girl does want that representation of herself and her beauty and her culture and her soul to, you know, be around and be included and play, you know, and um, it wasn't always and then it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think we've heard from everybody. I, here's another test that um, that I wanted to bring up. And and actually this test, I, I had never even heard of until, let's see, I used to, I think some of you all know, I used to um, run a my own youth nonprofit called the Black Hills Corner Incorporated. And so one day myself and one of the um, girl's parents, one of the mothers, and I did a workshop called loving the skin you're in and i found out about something called the paper bag test i'd never heard of it before and it was actually used from 1900 to the 1950s or so and it was used to determine uh you know the entrance and eligibility privileges to different establishments like various churches colleges universities um it was used by fraternities and sororities for a while into nightclubs or some workplaces. Again, this is called the paper bag test. And basically a paper bag would be held up to your face. And if you were you know, darker than that, you couldn't gain entrance into wherever. And I just, you know, I, when I heard about that, I was, I was so hurt because if I, I, you know, I applied for, to get into Spelman College, I got in and attended and graduated. But um, I was there from 1981 to 1985. So I would have been applying to get in um, in, I guess, fall of 1980 or spring of 81, whenever. <laughs> but uh, so, you know, but I'm hurt because if I had applied to that same school, you know, I was determined to go to a historically black college after having grown up in a predominantly white uh, suburb. And um, if I had applied 30 years earlier, I, I wouldn't have gotten in. You know, I'm slightly darker than a paper bag and they, I would have gotten a rejection letter. So that, that's pretty hurtful. Has anybody else heard of that test, the paper bag test? It, it's no longer used, but it was used 30 well, years I, ago. I wouldn't say that it's no longer used. <laughs> not, um, not visibly, not visibly. Not visibly, but... <laughs> I will say um, it goes back to, if I may, what I mm -hmm. stated was the color coding of white supremacy. See, we, we call it colorism, but let's be very clear. It's really the color codification of white supremacy. And the brown paper bag test was a way, because remember, this mentality is not coming from Black people. It's coming from the outside inside. And we are fueling it and continuing it. Uh, yeah. That color codification was used to really create division within our community, um, because Absolutely. those who uh, had, as they used to say, the complexion for the connection, that mm -hmm. was the brown paper bag test, the complexion for the connection. And you see this actually played out. Uh, not only in America, you see it played out in Central and South America, uh, you see it played out in the Caribbean, you see it played out in South Africa, uh, you see it played out on the subcontinent of India. Uh, one of the things uh, when you study history is that the Europeans would use this brown paper bag, if you want to, uh, a system by which those who may be a little lighter, who were generally the children of the slave master, or the children of the colonizers, they actually created a subclass uh, based on color within our communities to serve as a, uh, as, as, as a buffer. Perfect example of this, in South Africa, you had the uh, uh, children of the Afrikaners and South African women who were called colored. The coloreds 
uh, in South Africa were used as a buffer group between those South Africans who were struggling uh, from the apartheid system and the white Afrikaners, okay? Uh, even in Haiti, uh, on uh, Haiti, uh, prior to the Haitian Revolution, you had the children of the French colonizers by enslaved black women, uh, they called them at that time mulattoes. And that mulatto class, that lighter skinned group of blacks were given a little bit better status than the rest of their enslaved brethren uh, there in Haiti. And that created problems. And it, of course, the brown paper bag test uh, was throughout the South, even in uh, places like Washington, DC. Um, and, uh, you know, even if you look in our community, um, I attended here at Winston-Salem State University and many of our first leaders, if you were to look at them, you would think or mistake them for being white men, but they were very light. Uh, many of the noble professions in our, in our community, um, uh, some of the funeral home, uh, long-term funeral homes in our community, if you look at the family pictures, they're all very fair-skinned. Uh, some of the early educa educators uh, at uh, some of our first HBCUs, very, very fair-skinned and light-skinned. And I, I want to stop using that word fair-skinned because that's a, another play on words, um, but uh, we're very light-skinned. And unfortunately, this continues uh, to play out in our community. This unfortunately plays out in our communities today um, because just going back real quick, and I'm ending this uh, note uh, with the doll test, I think this is very important for educators and for those of us who have children in the educational system because that didn't happen. That view of those dolls didn't happen in a vacuum because now we have a little black girl who's in a classroom and the standard of beauty is what? It's Rapunzel whose hair is so long. It's Little Red Riding Hood. It's uh, Snow White, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? Uh, it's Goldilocks. So now you have uh, this, this doll, this Barbie doll with blonde hair, blue eyes. You have all of these uh, uh, fairy uh, tales and the standard of beauty is of this little black girl looking at these European uh, uh, fictional characters uh, with standards of beauty, blonde hair, blue eyes, red hair, long hair. And so this is an internal, unfortunately internal doctrination that plays out in real, real time. And unfortunately, uh, many of our people still suffer from this uh, today. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, I wanted to ask my mother to, to speak to some things. Um, she, my mother is a retired educator and she started uh, teaching in Tennessee in a black school, I believe. And then when my family moved to Wisconsin, um, she started teaching in this in the city of Milwaukee, but then we moved to a suburb of Milwaukee and she was a third grade teacher for several years. So there were a few black students in her classes and, and more um, students more black students as time passed she taught for you know some decades so i, I wanted to talk about how she um i guess uh mother evelyn if you could just talk about how you um helped the black girls and and the black boys in your classes um how you helped them with their self-esteem and everything you know here um Ethan grunt was just talking about how you know talking about the white people with the long blonde hair or whatever color and how that was a standard of beauty. So how did you address that in your classrooms? I didn't address it as a class uh, discussion, but individually. Right. Black children uh, were uh, generally uh, conscious of their hair and their skin color because they were one of uh, 25 children or two of 22 children. So I would praise them for any reason that I could think of. I would always make sure that I uh, would uh, say something great about what they were wearing even, or if it was the hair, 
oh, your hair is so pretty. Did your mom help you? Now, remember, these are third graders. If I found anything to praise them for, I did it. And I, I usually found something to say, because I truly believe self-esteem is so very important. And I said this before, I know I'm always saying that, uh, but uh, we need that desperately. The other thing though that happens when you are the only black teacher in the building is that you find out how white people, and these happen to be teachers or even parents function in terms of uh, color. We don't think about that. But I recall uh, talking with uh, a group of teachers who were my coworkers, and we were just having a casual conversation and all of a sudden one said, oh, uh, Mary had the baby yesterday. This is someone who was out on maternity leave. And then the other one said, oh, really? And next thing I know, she said, oh, and guess what? She's blonde, a little girl, a blonde. So that's real important because one of them, one of the teachers said, oh, isn't she lucky? So there you have the blonde color hair being the top choice. <laughs> And of course, don't forget the blue eyes. Those are colors and they are very evident in uh, many white uh, families. If someone is blonde, that's on top of the world. So uh, we tend to only think of the colors uh, with skin and our skin and uh, we don't think about the hair so much in terms of color. Most of us have dark color hair. Uh, but um, I think the main thing is that we talk about it and we think about uh, the color problem. So what do we do about helping our children love whatever they uh, have in terms of hair color or skin color. They're born with it. So if, if you have the opportunity to praise a young one, it's a good thing in my opinion. Absolutely, absolutely. I remember, um, let's see, I guess I would have been in about high, in high school and a lot of the entertainers in the black community were, um, they were like a, well, light, real light skin, high yellow is a term you, that was used back then. And they had um, like um, what, what people called good hair. It was like wavy, um, you know, uh, wavy hair, black hair. And that was when I was growing up and, and I don't know if this was well, it's from talking to everybody, we're all from different regions of the country. So it seems like that was, that is the preferred um, look. Uh, you know, I'm talking about men here. So um, when I was in high school, um, I'm sure you all have heard names like Al B. Shore, um, the DeBarge brothers, you know, they all had that look, that real light skin, um, wavy hair look. And you know, it took me years to, that was a preference. And so I would, I would go to parties and hear other girls talking about this and, oh, I like so-and-so, you know, it, that was a preference and it, it took me years to get out of that. So I'm saying that to say, okay, I was in high school. So I would have been, let's say 15, 16, 17, but just think if when our kids who are, you know, eight years old, 10 years old, hear things like that, that, that those things, those preferences, those biases stay with them forever. It's really unfortunate. Does anybody have any other comments right now or? Well, I might add, oh, sorry. Um, Mother Evelyn um, 
her point about, you know, being able to call out the beauty in each and every person. Mm -hmm. And I do think it's really important. And we see more and more, um, you know, now the idea of representation and not waiting for these big brands to go ahead and make the changes, but where people are stepping up because either my daughter, my son needs to see that they are beautiful, that they are, um, that they are able to do any and everything and it, like really being able to position that well. I, I like how the market has really opened up because um, we aren't waiting for um, the big brands to represent us, but people are saying that there's a hole in the market and this is something that I can really contribute in a way that shows the, um, the range, the spectrum of beauty. And beauty isn't just one thing, one type, um, but it can really be seen in multiple um, ways and in, in, in every person really, right? Um, the other thing that, uh, going back to the paper bag test that um, I wanted to just kind of maybe amplify a little bit. So definitely I, I think that we see um, embedded because it's a hard thing to, um, you know, th this has been years, right? Um, centuries where these uh, ways of thinking have just been embedded into systems, right? And so it's hard to dismantle it. Uh, but it does need to happen. But even though we don't have, you know, the official paper bag test anymore, we do see where um, the notions, the ideals of this or the essence of this plays out in hiring practices and the ways that we um, either, uh, you know, cast people in, um, in movies and shows and that type of thing. And I think it's just something, one, to be aware of, conscious of, and ensuring that we are um, really calling out when these things happen so that um, progress can be made to really dismantle it and really re rebuild a system that um, does not prefer or show um, discriminatory practices based upon, um, you know, what we're calling these shades is acceptability. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Okay. Vicky, is, let's see. I wanted to say one thing, Vicki, um, about, okay. about the description you had with the, um, the male perspective of colorism. And I think it changes every soul generation. Um, my yeah. experience in high school was the opposite, where um, the males with, that were darker were perceived as strong and you know, they were valued more and the lighter skin ones were kind of considered as the weaker and kind of shunned a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it definitely changed over brothers, time. Uh, light skin yeah. brothers are in and black skin brothers are in and it kind of flip flops every now and then. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure why, um, but I just mm -hmm. felt like they were at a total opposite uh, as far as fe femininity beauty. Like females are better uh, judged on their uh, characterism if they looked uh, on the lower, lighter skin scale, but it was the opposite for the males. Um, you know, the preferred black male was the darker one in my experience in high school. I don't know if anybody else experienced that as well. Mm -hmm. I would say um, I definitely saw that happening. Um, for me, though, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I didn't get the I, I got a mixture of, of both sides of it. I I wasn't assumed to be the cutest girl in school just because I was light, scent, light skin, but uh, at least not by the boys, but the girls always assumed that I was stuck up because I was light skin. So the whole uh, explanation of, okay, light skin girls have it better. Everybody wants the light skin girls. The boys were not checking for me. Just for, I don't know if it was because I was a nerd or what, but they were not checking for me. And so I wasn't seen as, okay, all the guys are after me and, and they're not giving the dark skin girls love. I, I saw um, boys make fun of me and, and make fun of the way that I looked and, and basically called me ugly all the time. And I experienced that pretty much up until high school. Um, but at the same time, from the from the girls in school, I got a lot of hate because they were like, "Oh, you think you 
hot stuff because you light or you think you better than everybody because you light. I'm like, actually, no, I don't. I, it doesn't cross my mind. I'm not thinking like that at all. <laughs> you know, my, my, my brother is very, very dark skinned. He is chocolate and, and, and my dad is chocolate and <laughs> my mom is brown skinned. I'm pretty much the lightest one. And so I was not raised with this idea of light skin versus dark skin because there were so many shades in my family. It wasn't really talked about like that. You know, once I started experiencing it in school, that's when it was brought up to me. But mm -hmm. um, as I got older and became an adult, I did really, really see the difference in, in, as far as how people would see you. Like more, more of what I saw in, in high school seemed to happen more as I got older, certain assumptions about me. And then that also turned into something different when I started being around white people, because white people would tell me, oh, you know, you, you're that perfect shade. If I was black, I would want to be your shade. Like I hated that. And it's like, wow. that's not a, that's not a compliment because now you're saying that for some reason you favor me and that I mean it's not like I'm gonna feel good like oh thank you you want to be my shade that they would always say your shade is 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 the best shade to have if you're black I wouldn't want to be darker than that that's totally not the right thing to say <laughs> no absolutely not wow. or um there would be people that would say oh I'm almost darker than you like this is from white people so you know whenever they would get a tan so it just experiencing that from, like I said, the girl's perspective, the boy's perspective, and then later on into, you know, seeing how white people saw me, you know, also realizing that white people sometimes assumed that I was less dangerous or less aggressive because I was light-skinned. You are more like us. Oh, you're different. You're not like the other black people. Like that's code speak that, you know, I would just like, okay, that's not, eh. I don't even have words for it, but it, it's something that I had to learn to just correct. You know, now at first I wouldn't know what to say, but now I've learned to correct. Whether I'm dealing with a dark skinned woman who goes, oh, you think you, no, actually I don't. And let me tell you about my experience. Or I'm dealing with a, a white person who's just like, oh, you're the perfect. No, that's not the way you want to come at me with this because we're all beautiful no matter what shade it is. It's just one of those things that seem hard to navigate, especially when you talk about the privilege of it all. People, I, I will admit as a light-skinned black woman, there is a certain privilege I hold being light-skinned. And I'm, I'm highly aware of that. Just like I feel like there are certain privileges men hold versus women. Mm -hmm. I'm aware of the inequities when it comes to media and movies showcasing more lights lighter skinned women than darker skinned women i'm aware of those things but when it comes to how to how to solve it how to how to go about it man it just seems like such a a complex thing because the the, the mentality behind it is so deep rooted yeah mm -hmm. you know if if i may i being in it, working in it in the fashion industry that I that I've worked in for the past five years, um, I, whenever I've done a show of my own work, I've always consciously cast black women. I've always consciously cast black women of different sizes and of different shapes uh, and shades and hair colors. Um, to the point where I would do renderings for clothing. Um, and I remember when I sent in my sketches to be reviewed for a job, they even commented, they were like, oh, all of your models are black. And it was like, yeah, because that's what inspires me. Those are the conscious choices that I make to sort of fill in this gap of an idea of, of what is beauty and what, you know, they always say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Well, I happen to be the beholder in this situation. So I'm showcasing um, my idea of, of what, should, what should be seen. Um, and I, I agree with Crystal in the idea that, you know, the year, 
in in the year the year that we live in 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 the environment that we live in everybody's got to make their own space um, because what we're finding out more and more is that they're not going to give it to you so you've got to create the space to showcase black beauty we saw that with um the Johnson Publishing Company and Ebony and Jet. And we saw that with black fashion designers coming on to the, to the scene and the Black Lives Matter movement. We, we're creating these spaces for ourselves to discuss, uh, much like what we're doing here um, with, the, with the Diversity Matters panel, we're, we're creating these spaces to bring these things to life. And I think without that, um, without us sort of taking, apart, taking it apart bit by bit, um, we're not going to get much further. So it's things like this and making conscious choices to buy a Black doll for your child or buy books with Black black characters and Black illustrations or showcase Black art on the wall like, like Barbara was talking about for her, for her family um, that, that start to strip away at the, the, the supremacist attitude that we are fed. And it does also clash, you know, you find yourself in situations where you're with white people and they say to you, oh, you're the perfect shade of black, or what are you mixed with? Why are you that color? I don't understand. And it's like, well, I don't necessarily want to have the conversation with you that my great, great, great grandmother, um, what, what, was forced to be with a Confederate general. Is that the conversation you wanted to have about my skin color today? You know, they, they don't realize sometimes how uncomfortable they, they make people and, and then get upset about the response that you have because the color of my skin is more than just what you see on the outside, it's a, it's a history. Of, of the struggle of what people have gone through. So I think that the more that we, as Black people, as Afro-Latin people, as, as people of color, make the choices to, to lift each other up in that way, the better we'll be and the more that we'll strip away at the idea of colorism. Because I think, we, I think the time for waiting or, or asking people through other things, through other channels and means has passed. They've, they've proven time and time again that even though they may understand it, they're not willing to do anything about it. And so I do my part by saying, you see these seven Black women? Yes, I'm casting each one of them. I understand that she's a size 22. I can sew for a size 22, and she's going to walk the runway for me. And I had a casting director say to me, well, you just want Black women. I said, yes, I do, because, that's, because Black women inspire me. And that's how I want to, to showcase my, my clothing, and that's my idea of beauty. So you, I think the more that we stand in it, the better, the better we'll be. Kudos to you, Bennett, for highlighting Black women. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes. Um, Barbara. Hey. Bar I hi. So um, I, I think I, I don't think I mentioned this earlier. I know Barbara from my organization, the Black Girls Corner Incorporated. She brought her two daughters to me, and I had several other, um, several other women who helped mentor her daughters and other ones. So I, I know Barbara is someone who, you know, she was always saying, oh, we need to expose these black girls to this and this. So, you know, I, I admire, I've always admired you for wanting to expose black, young black girls or boys really to um, just to, to culture and our, our greatness. So can you, do you wanna speak more about that just as a parent? Um, and a role model, a mentor, you know, how we can expose our kids more. Opportunities are endless. Um, can you speak up a little bit? Yeah, sorry about that. I said opportunities are endless for us to expose our children today. Um, a couple of things I did want to say. For me, once I moved, I consider the South, some people, you know, it's not deep South, but I'm from Southern California. And most of the experience I had on a negative aspect as far as colorism came from within the black community. Um, I grew up 
with a variety of different ethnicities, cultures, and I think the positiveness that I received was input from non-Blacks, non-African Americans, because they accepted me for who I was, how I was, and it was those mm-hmm. within my own culture. If there was a negative issue, it came from them, which is interesting, which is very interesting, and I know that it's all a part of brainwashing and, and the systemic racial um, ignorance and deliberate, but um, it saddens me that the non-Black community that I was around put more positiveness in me in, in that light than the African American community. And I think that made a difference, makes a difference geographically. When I hear people talk from different places, um, and I'm so thankful I got that opportunity to grow up in Southern California. Um, also, I guess the timeliness of things. I'm, I, it made me realize TV shows like um, 227, Moesha, um, What's Happening, Good Times. Um, racism, colorism always existed, but those shows had females who were not necessarily passing that brown paper bag test. And um, so the people that I did grow up with got to see people who maybe looked more like me in a light that was considered an okay or good light. And then I I thought about the Cosby show, very popular, wonderful show, love it. But the characters on there is the older daughters, and that was representative kind of my family. You know, they had four daughters, Rudy was brown, Vanessa was brown, and then there was um, Lisa Bonet and and the other actress who appeared to be, um, well, biracial in real life, whatever the case. But but you can be born of whatever color coming from a black woman, which, like I said, was the case in my family. But I also realized during the time with entertainers, with that, I remember the, the, the tone or the voice and the culture around me changing to more so of what you all talked about, the lighter you were, the white, the better, and more acceptable. And I saw that change within the music industry, the entertainment industry. I don't recall seeing it as much prior to but after that and during that, <clears throat> I saw it a lot. And black, <clears throat> excuse me, black men and things began to preference and vocalize more so, or maybe it was just because of the age of internet and things happening where you could more easily and readily hear and see these things where they would say, that's what I want. That's the thing. Um, prior to, I don't recall that so much. And I don't recall that. Um, from people who I knew who were not black. So that that's really interesting for me. There's a lot of work we got to do within ourselves. As a mother, I just always, always imparted. If I didn't have what it took, then I was putting them in, in, the, in front of someone of color, male or female, so they could see the black lawyer, the black teacher, the black doctor, whatever it took, scientist. And I recall that um, my girls were part of a group in California as well, a uh, mm-hmm. sorority, sisterhood group. And it was a woman from the South. We don't have the same thing going on that we have here with frats and, and sorority. So I was like, wow. And I remember asking how she felt growing up in the South under some of the Jim Crow situations. And she said, well, baby, All we knew was were black doctors. All we knew were black teachers. All we knew were black professionals because we couldn't go to those other areas. And that that was a light bulb for me. And it it made a difference because I had grown up going to a variety of different people. But from that point on, I recall looking for my daughters, looking for black people in the professional world so they can see we can be all these things. We have been all these things. And that kind of minimizes or erases um, when we place value on something other than outward appearance. That was my goal. Place your value not in this this shell that we're in, but what's internal, what's in your brain, what's in your heart. And I know my girls are browner in my family. They're the browner ones. They're not as dark as I am, but I see each of them having a value for other Black women. And that for that, I'm very mm-hmm. thankful. So that's just, that's just Absolutely. always been a goal of mine. You need to see and know that you're worthwhile. And I did see the colorism 
from the non-African Americans in their family where the blonde hair, the blue eye versus the brunette with brown eyes. And that touched my heart. That touched my heart because I saw them being treated the way many blacks express being treated about colorism. So that's, um, mm-hmm. I just hope that we can continue all of us make an effort to, to stop this nonsense because that's what it is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for your input. Let's see, Rosa. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Do you have any comments? Uh, I definitely agree with um, Ms. Barbara. Um, it, it is nonsense, and sometimes it comes in forms of joking, but it's not a joke. It is long lasting. Uh, you know, like uh, Mother Evelyn expressed, it's a self esteem issue. And it needs to start with the young children, but it needs to continue on. You, you never know what adults are carrying as far as their views on colorism. And we need to affirm with each other, even as adults. You know, I've gotten into, you know, just really embracing people, even total strangers, and letting them know, hey, you know, I'll, I'll use words of affirmation. Hey, beautiful. Hey, sister. You know, stuff like that. And I, I think we need to continue that you know, in case they are experiencing some nonsense from their workplace or even within the families, like unfortunately we've talked about, um, but you know, and and the things that we do still see on TV, you know, I try to explain to my children, there was a time where just black people weren't wanted on television. They didn't want to see it. And it, you know, started putting us in certain roles and then you know, there was some backlash when we started being more in the forefront, but they still prefer the, the lighter, you know, the fair skin, or I'm sorry, light skin effort, <laughs> and the uh, less coarse hair and, you know, stuff like that. And, and I, I think it's nonsense. It, it needs to stop and we all have to do our part to battle that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anyone else? We have about 15 more minutes. May I say, Vicki? Yes. Uh, in terms of solutions, um, to everyone's point, I think we have to be intentional. Like Ronald said, you know, he specifically seeks to highlight Black women in all of your splendor, your beauty, and your diversity. So I think we 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 have to be intentional, and I think we have to be unapologetic. And as I was listening to Barbara, I was literally going through time as as I was. She was really articulating history. And uh, I think arts and culture is very powerful. Because a lot of the changes that we saw when you talked about that whole light skin, uh, team light skin, team dark skin, I remember in the early 80s, because that's what the industry gave to us. It gave us Michael, the light skin version of Michael, it gave us the light skin, beautiful version of Prince, it gave us L. DeBarge. But when you got to the 90s, uh, you saw, of course, the Cosby show, and we saw us in our diversity. And then you start getting movies like uh, Love Jones. You start getting movies like Love and Basketball. So you have these black men, brown skinned black men in these leading roles, right? And so now here we are in 2020 with the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, the young people are reaffirming their blackness, you know, Black Lives Matter and wearing afros and, and the whole uh, nostalgia that came out of the 60s where Black was beautiful. So I think we're at a, uh, at a renaissance in our history as Black people. And um, to your mother's point, she made an excellent point, reaffirming to the younger generation that you are beautiful. And I think we have to begin there with truth. Truth is that we as African people are the first people under the sun. We are the original people. And if you look on the continent of Africa, we are a diverse people. Uh, you can find us the most beautiful black in Southern Sudan among the Dinka. They are so beautiful and black until they have traces of purple and blue in their skin. And then we have people who are your complexion in the South called the sand people that they give the misnomer of the Bushmen. These people are naturally your complexion and all throughout Africa, uh, before any type of uh, mixing or anything of that nature, we have diversity uh, in, 
in us. And that diversity comes from you all as black women because biologists have found out that the African woman has the most, most genetic diversity within her. She can go from beautiful midnight black to vanilla complexion person all within the womb of the black woman. So I think we have to celebrate that. I think we have to educate our children as soon as they come out about the diversity uh, and the diversity in our hair. You know, uh, we are not a monolithic people, even in terms of phenotype. Uh, most of what we see in America are black people who were enslaved from West Africa. And so we have unique features um, but if you go throughout Africa, you'll go to Somali or Ethiopia, beautiful, tall uh, brothers and sisters, some with wavy hair, some with straight hair. So all of this is within us. And I think we have to celebrate it. We have to reaffirm it that um, Black is inclusive of, of, of so much diversity. Uh, and I think we have to give that to our children. And we have to be unapologetic about it, uh, no matter who that offends. Uh, if they are offended by it, um, you know, we can't we can't worry about people being offended for the truth. And I think sometimes we worry about um, a, 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 and I don't want to say in a in a harsh way, um, because we want to be considerate of individuals feelings. But uh, to Ronald's point, we, we got to, you know, we got to be unapologetic and lift our people up, uh, because if we don't do it, no one else is going to do it. And I think we have to hold each other accountable as well. You know, I'm a part of the hip hop generation. Um, and there are some things that, uh, even though I love hip hop music, it's done some wonderful things, but it created problems in terms of some of the earlier videos that highlighted very light skinned black women, uh, those who had fair skin, lighter hair, lighter eyes. But that's changing now. Um, before, we would only have someone of, uh, who, who, who had that particular standard of beauty, but now we get a, you know, a Jill Scott or Erica Badu, we see black women in their beauty. We see black men in their beauty. And I think we have to celebrate each other as well um, because one of the things that white supremacy plays off of is our divisions. So we cannot afford to be uh, divided, especially in this climate. So I think we have to cel uh, celebrate uh, the diversity among us uh, as black men and women and highlight that and, and be proud of it and be unapologetically black. Uh, you know, that's how I raise my children. I tell them, it, don't, don't, don't apologize for your black. Be bold, black, and beautiful. I think that was uh, 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 from uh, Hollywood Shuffle, the bold, the black, and the beautiful. Absolutely. <laughs> some, okay. some might not remember that. <laughs> that's too funny. Okay, um, before I close, let me hear from, um, from Crystal. If you have any comments and then I'm going to, and then I'm going to have my mother um, speak after Crystal and then I'll close after that. We have about eight more minutes left. Okay, great. Um, you know, so I would just maybe a, a couple things, I guess, but um, what I would amplify is, you know, what Efren Guan said and what um, Ronald mentioned and thinking about, um, you know, not asking for permission, but instead creating the tables that, or the spaces that we want to see representation in. Um, I, I love the idea. So, I mean, there are so many different ways and different spaces that we can really think about um, celebrating the spectrum of color. And so I absolutely love, you know, just the idea of nude for every shade. So like in, you know, in the fashion world where we're seeing that nude isn't just for like, I don't have to wear the white woman's nude anymore, but nude really is starting to represent so many different shades on the spectrum. And I think um, when we start seeing more and more awareness of the fact that um, there is not this, you know, Eurocentric or white, um, a standard of beauty, but beauty is across the spectrum. That just is um, really wonderful. And I also am encouraged by just seeing so many different representations in, you know, 
in classrooms um, that, well, starting in classrooms with the books and literature. And also I'm hoping that we can see, um, you know, just a, a departure from revisionist history and really looking at um, telling the truth in all the spaces that need to, because even though, um, you know, even think about my own personal um, experience, even though as parents and as um, concerned, you know, people in the community exposing our kids to um, their history and also affirming them, if uh, they are still being placed into systems and environments that um, are telling them lies, then it's, it's just so hard to combat that, right? So everything that you're doing gets kind of like torn down during the day <laughs> when they're into these um, other environments that aren't um, reinforcing that. So uh, I would say, you know, really being able to advocate for uh, representation in our schools and the curriculum and in the materials that are used, um, because not only do our, our um, Black kids need to see that Black is beautiful, but everyone needs to see that. And then also seeing the representation that, you know, people of color, no matter where they are, wh where they're from, that's beautiful. And really being able to, um, you know, have that embedded more. Um, the other thing that I'll say is, I mean, I, I think about some of the um, pivotal uh, pieces, um, whether it was a book or a speech or a movie from um, my history that really made a difference. And I keep coming back with the idea of colorism to school days. And, you know, the, the dance, um, the, well, I guess it was everything, but the dance was really just the big part where we had the wannabes and the jigaboos. And I really just, thinking back, um, you know, what it must have took for Spike Lee to just be very, um, very deliberate about this needs to be exposed, this needs to be seen, and for it to be in, um, you know, on a, a very public national stage, I think was really pivotal. So even now, when I look at it as, you know, I guess that was the 80s, right? So now um, 35 or however many years later, um, there's still unfortunately like some truth where you're like, oh, I see this today. But also I think it's a really good mirror. And I think art needs to be a mirror to uncover, you know, some of those hard truths to expand the discussion and conversation and really um, help us come to grips with what that is and how we can move forward. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, Mother Evelyn, would you like to make some comments? You, you are the the one on here with us who is the, the wisest, has the most decades of experience with colorism. So any closing comments? Well, it's very, very encouraging to hear all of you young people discussing topics that are normally not even discussed. So that's a real uh, progressive way to help solve problems that we have in our communities, in our lives. Um, it's very encouraging to know that it's acceptable now to talk about topics that may not be comfortable for everyone. So in terms of what we do in the future, we need to think about continuing to talk, but also what can we do to help with solutions? Because that's what's going to make all the difference in the world, the solution part of our conversations. Um, solutions are not easy and it takes a while sometimes, but at least we can begin. And I'm real proud of all of you and others who are embracing discussions and problem solving at this time. 
and I'm happy to be here. And of course I am old. So I'm pleased that all of you listen to me a little bit. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you all. I, I wanna thank all my panelists, my event uh, specialists, and my two guest panelists, my mother, Evelyn Hughes, and my friend, Barbara McKinney. Thank you all for participating. This has been an awesome conversation. We, we are all different. Um, we come from different generations, different. We grew up in different geographical regions of the country and in various families. And we, we've all had different experiences. We've had different biases or, or just um, things that have influenced us. And you know, I agree with my mother, Evelyn Hughes. It, it's just beautiful to see us all talking and um, you know, just really talking about colorism and bringing it to light. Thank you viewers for watching. We hope that you've been enlightened. And we also encourage you all to start having conversations like this with friends, coworkers, neighbors, church members, family members, whomever. Uh, again, thank you for watching. It's about 10 o'clock and we will be back. Um, I'm not sure of the topic yet, but we will be back in two weeks and to have a conversation again. This is an ongoing dialogue and this, is diver this has been, you've been watching Diversity Matters. Thank you and good night. Good night.